I, I have seen multiple people try paralyzation in the EBM of the past. And so could you explain uh, why, from your perspective, that hasn't worked? You know, with, with any change that like looks obvious in retrospect, people are always like, well, why didn't someone just do this? Before? It's a matter of execution and, and focus. And I think it, from what I've seen, and maybe I've missed some other um, efforts, but a lot of the parallelization efforts are like shorter term experiments. Like, you know, we're going to try this for a weekend and then post about it on Twitter and we got like a 2x speed up. It was great. It needs to be done with a longer term goal in mind, which is to accelerate all parts of the pipeline and deliver much higher performance. And I think that that just requires a focused team. Super excited for today's podcast. Today I'm joined with Keone. He's building Monad, uh, the paralyzed EVM, uh, new layer one. And I'm also joined with Omar. Uh, maybe before we dive a little bit deep into like all the technical stack, Omar, could you give a brief intro? Uh, Going to have Omar do be co-hosting the podcast uh, with me as well. Uh, Kieran, it's, it's very nice to have you and uh, we're a fan of what you're building. A, b a very brief background myself, uh, a long time ago, uh, applied maths, then uh, turned that somehow into... Uh, magic internet money and, and trading uh, coins on the internet with uh, cartoon characters. That turned into uh, venture capital. And uh, today I have the distinction of being the head of investments at Meta Labs, the team that brought you ZK Sync and a lot of other wonderful things. Awesome. Yeah, good to, good to be with both of you guys today. Perfect. Uh, well, really appreciate it. I think this is going to be a, a super fun podcast. Uh, before diving into specifically what you're building at Monad, could you just also give a brief background about your history, how you ultimately got to uh, building up until the point of Monad? Yeah, sure thing. Um, just to give a quick intro, I'm Keone. I started my career in 2011. Um, in the high frequency trading space, uh, spent two years at a company called GetGo, and then moved over to Jump Trading in 2013, and uh, spent eight years there. It was a really great experience. Learned a lot about building really high performance trading systems. Um, I was on a team of about ten people, um, serving as quant and team lead there. Um, so did a lot of machine learning stuff and a lot of just building high performance trading systems to go and compete in major centralized venues um, in traditional finance, such as the CME, uh, Eurex exchange, other exchanges like that. Um, and then I spent a little bit of time, uh, like seven or eight months in the crypto division of Jump, mostly working on Solana DeFi, um, along with my co-founder, James, who was my teammate starting in 2014. We've been working together ever since then worked together on the HFT systems for a number of years, and then worked together on Solana DeFi. Um, Jump is a really great company. Um, they're very um, thoughtful about investing in technology at a very early stage, um, have always been an early mover in investing in different technologies um, as a automated trader, and then uh, got involved in crypto quite early, I think in 2015 or 16. Um, started, they started a crypto group there in 2015 or 16 and have just been involved in the space as traders and researchers and developers for a number of years. Um, and for James and me, we, we joined the Jump Crypto team in 2021 and started working on some DeFi projects there. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, Yep. Amazing. Uh, I guess on that front, I mean, now, I mean, wor working in high frequency trading, uh, working also in the Solana ecosystem, what were some of like the, I mean, big learning lessons there? Um, and then ultimately, I mean, I guess maybe backing up, I mean, were, were there any specific things that you learned in high frequency trading that you kind of either saw parallels into like the blockchain ecosystem. Um, after that, I guess, like what kind of working in slide inside the Solana ecosystem made you more interested in like building out the EVM and the EVM tech stack? Yeah. 
High frequency trading is really just all about efficiency. Um, you know, the the public perception of it is that it's really focused on latency wars and really optimizing, like, you know, uh, microwave towers and, and cables and things like that, optimizing your software. Um, all of that is true, but all of it's really done in the pursuit of um, just making more competitive markets. And um, the result is that in traditional finance, the markets are extremely, extremely tight. Um, like if you look at the um, ES, which is the S&P 500 future contract, um, it's a futures contract that's, I believe, 50 times the uh, yeah, 50 times the the S&P 500 index value. Um, so it has a notional value of like $250,000. And the minimum increment uh, is $12.50. Um, and in reality, people are... So yeah, when people make a trade, um, they're paying like $6 in spread on something that's $250,000. So it's just very, very small. And then in practice, the high-frequency traders are competing for edges that are much, much smaller than that, like on their order of cents. Um, so it's just really a very optimized environment, which ultimately gives um, all investors, retail investors, institutional investors, et cetera, a really good low-cost trading experience, which allows them to transfer risk more efficiently. Um, and it's just the result of this really competitive war going on between different automated players to make markets as tightly as possible. Um, and when we started getting involved more on the DeFi side and we looked at um, the state of the world with respect to automated market makers and the typical slippage that um, a you know, anyone interacting with an AMM would encounter, we were just really surprised by how much, you know, multiple orders of magnitude larger slippage, um, like the slippage for someone trading in that, uh, in that case that I mentioned before, like trading the ES, um, you know, fractions of a basis point, like a 10th of a basis point or less. Um, and then in, you go to DeFi and it's very common for people to experience 1% slippage or 2% slippage. That's very normal. Um, so we just realized that there is still a big gap between DeFi and centralized finance. Also, another thing is that people frequently kind of compare like the experience of trading on DeFi versus the experience of trading on Binance. But then Binance itself is still like several tiers below what the you know, really advanced centralized exchanges and traditional finance are in terms of the number of basis points of slippage that one would typically pay. Um, so there's just really, really a big gap and the gap gets narrowed by making it much more efficient for participants to be able to go compete and be able to compete on making the absolute tightest markets possible, which frequently requires frequent updates um, because the prices are changing all the time and you're reacting to supply and demand and reacting to other exchanges. So as market makers need to be able to frequently update their quotes. And right now the high cost of updating each one of those quotes means that as a result, they end up with just really wide spreads, or we end up using um, systems like AMMs to, to quote um, markets in DeFi. So anyway, that's a really long-winded way of saying that we just see that there are kind of a lot of different um, optimizations that uh, were needed in order to help decentralized finance take over the world. And they really started at the base layer. Definitely. Uh, I definitely want to get into more of like throughput and being able to set like those bid and ask uh, on the order book aside, like what, what will it take to actually get there? But before I think, I mean, you obviously got to see pretty up and close uh, with Solana kind of um, the Solana DeFi system. Solana was also, I believe, the first virtual machine that was also parallelizable. Uh, it has since kind of, or one of the first, uh, many have kind of followed in suit. Uh, the Ethereum kind of in its early iterations or and still as today single threaded uh it's just a little bit more simple of a virtual machine but 
I think the big innovation that you have unlocked at Monad is uh, the parallelization of the virtual machine. Can you talk maybe just briefly, because I know numerous times in the past, uh, there's been multiple different attempts at trying to parallelize the virtual machine. Why have those failed? And I guess, how are you doing it differently that you are able to kind of parallelize the uh, Ethereum virtual machine? Mm -hmm. Uh, we do optimistic parallelization. So we're running transactions in parallel um, and always ensuring that we get the same outcome as if we had run those transactions serially. Um, so just to be clear, there is still uh, linearity in blocks in Monad. There is still linearity of transactions within that block. But then when we go to execute, um, we run transactions in parallel and you know, roll back transactions that um, have their predicate actually affected by another transaction that was running in parallel as well. So may then, maybe get into um, uh, the dependency algorithm that you ultimately use um, in order to sort of make that assessment. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the idea of, and maybe it's explained to the listener, uh, the idea, the, the separation between sort of optimistic execution and then having a formal ordering and guarantees before you go into execution and the trade-offs there. Right. Yeah. The, um, I guess it's kind of like a big design decision for um, any blockchain about the format of transactions and basically to what extent are there pre is there a pre-specification of all dependencies for a given transaction? Um, so like for an example, um, Solana has stateless programs. Um, all of the state lives in external accounts and those accounts have to get passed into the function calls. So effectively the dependencies are specified ahead of time. Um, with EIP, I believe it's 2930. Um, there's the idea of introducing access lists. So like a list of, um, again, like, accounts that are going to be touched by a given transaction, um, which then would could potentially be used by Ethereum to prefetch dependencies. Um, but yeah, I think basically the state of the world is that uh, wallets are quite slow to adapt to changes in transaction format. The reality of the world is that most users interact with the blockchain using MetaMask. Um, and basically in order to preserve compatibility with the kind of gateway that the end user is actually accessing the blockchain through, which is MetaMask, um, we elected to not use EIP 2930 um, and just handle everything on the back end on our side. So if, if that's the case, uh, could an Ethereum client basically um... And, you know, and instead, instead of saying, okay, let, let me, let's start from scratch because I'm going to inherit uh, the date, the same data structures. I'm going to inherit the same infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to use optimistic parallelism here. I'm not going to have, you know, true explicit uh, state dependencies upfront. Could I just implement this at the client level? Do, or do I have, do I need a sort of new network to do this? Uh, correct. You could implement this particular thing at the client level. And so what, just from your experience, what has stopped um, the, the communities from moving towards that in the past? Um, I think the biggest thing is that there are multiple bottlenecks. Um, a huge bottleneck is state access for the transactions that are being done. Um, and this is because, you know, even with all the state living on SSD, uh, pulling data from the SSD is still... Um, believe like in the 10 to 20 microsecond range. Um, and these are, the, you know, there's just a lot of um, accesses from disk. And then on top of that, the actual state is being stored in typically a, a high level key value store like level DB um, or rocks DB, LMDB, MDBX, sorry. They're all just kind of forks of level DB. Um, so there's not really optimization on the state access front. Um, which is another area where we've made significant improvements in order to be able to access state really fast. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, we have a, a giant list of transactions. Um, Ethereum is the 
what do they call it? The world computer. Like the idea is that the entire world's transactions are all going to be processed against a single node, and then we'll replicate the node to have many copies. Um, so fundamentally, the the constraint um, is really like how efficiently you can access all of the state that all of those transactions are depending on. Um, and some blockchains kind of get around this by um, really raising the RAM requirements um, because RAM is much more efficient to access than SSD. And then they just try to keep a lot of the active state in RAM. Um, but we don't agree with that philosophy either. So in any event, I guess to go back to your question, like, yes, Ethereum clients could implement this specific optimization, but there are a bunch of other ones that all taken together, alleviate all of the bottlenecks in the pipe, and then allow us to pack a lot more computation into a given amount of time. And I could talk about some of the other optimizations as well, but yeah, um, I yeah. think the... I, I, I would love to learn, I mean, I, I have seen multiple people try parallelization in the EVM of the past. And so could you explain uh, why, from your perspective, that hasn't worked? And then maybe also list like the high level optimizations uh, making the EVM paralyzed, one being one of them, but the other things uh, that you're currently mentioning, what what would you highlight as the key differentiators in your tech stack um, from uh, like previous attempts? Right. Yeah, I would say that um, you know, with with any change that like looks obvious in retrospect, people are always like, "Well, why didn't someone just do this before?" Like people tried it, but didn't. I, I think it's it's just. Um, it's a matter of execution and, and focus. And I think it, from what I've seen, and maybe I've missed some other um, efforts, but a lot of the parallelization efforts are like shorter term experiments. Like, you know, we're going to try this for a weekend and then post about it on Twitter. And we got like a 2x speed <laughs> up. That's great. Um, but it is, it's like, it needs to be done with a longer term goal in mind, which is to, accelerate all parts of the pipeline and deliver much higher performance. Um, and I think that that just requires a focused team with, um, you know, they'll like quit their jobs from other things and are just super focused on, on doing that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't feel that what we're doing is like something that's insane or like totally inconceivable. It's, it's more just about um, focus and execution. Well, let's get into uh, a little bit more of those uh, optimizations. The one that's sort of um, maybe non-trivial for uh, a garden variety Ethereum client to, to sort of run. And then perhaps mm -hmm. that, that could lead us into um, a, 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 an interesting topic, which is consensus. And I know you you guys have your own sort of flavor of consensus, and it, it takes bits and pieces of what works. But I'm curious how you sort of put it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the... You know, one of the really significant changes is uh, what we call deferred execution. Um, so really just the idea that, actually, sorry, to take a step back um, with existing, you know, most existing blockchains um, that are leader-based, the process is the leader selects a list of transactions from the mempool um, that's going to be the official list of transactions. Um, executes all of those transactions, determines the Merkle root that results from that new state, and then publishes a block with all of those transactions and the new Merkle root. And then the other validating nodes, like the other ones participating in consensus, go execute those transactions as well, um, check that the Merkle root matches, and then vote yes or no. And that entire sequence is really what completes um, the production of a block. And of course, I glossed over the details of how consensus works and the multiple rounds of voting and so on. But the point is that to produce a block, you have to execute twice, like the leader executes and then the validators execute, and you have to have consensus happening. And the thing about consensus is that you you know if you want your nodes to be decentralized, that means that they're potentially on opposite sides of the world. Um, and you know, the round trip time around the world is literally uh, hundreds of milliseconds. So, um, you know, consensus ends up taking up most of that. If it's a one second block time, most of that one second is spent on consensus. So execution is actually 
you know, the budget for execution is actually quite limited uh, because it has to fit into that sequence. Um, now with Monad, we actually move execution out of that hot path. So the nodes just come to consensus about the official ordering of transactions. They're validating that um, all the transactions have valid signatures. They're validating that the transactions have sufficient gas in their account to pay for, um, to be paid for. Um, but then the execution happens in a slightly deferred fashion, like um, basically happening in parallel to the next round of consensus happening for the next block. So what that means is that execution is a little bit delayed. Um, oh, and then by the way, we um, just do some other things to ensure that the nodes are still in consistent state. Um, make sure that like do other things to make sure that the API or like the interface from the user's perspective is still very similar to Ethereum. Um, but yeah, the execution is just happening in a slightly delayed fashion. Um, and I want to just say one other thing about that and then kind of pause for a second. But, um, you know, and the, the idea of having execution be a little bit delayed, having the nodes have a slightly delayed view of the state of the world sounds scary. But in reality, we always have a delayed state of the world. Like when you open your MetaMask, it's going and querying a node. And then that node is responding. But then in the time that it's responded, more things could have happened on the blockchain. So I think inherently, we always live with the delayed view of the true state of the world. But the true state is actually just determined at the time of consensus, because that defines the official ordering of transactions, which officially defines the state. And then execution is just revealing that state. Well, let's... Uh... Let's get into that, the, the, the bits about ordering, but uh, let, let me just uh, ask one cl clarification here. So hmm. do you have two rounds of consensus, one on execution and one on ordering? Uh, no, we have one round of consensus for ordering. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about ordering then. So is there a canonical way in which transactions are ordered? Um, they're ordered using the priority gas auction method. So just you know, ordered from highest to lowest um, priority fee. But that's up to, ultimately up to the block proposer. Correct. Okay. So um, this immediately opens up the, the age-old question of, now age-old, I suppose, MEV. Let's talk, mm -hmm. let's talk a little about, about MEV. Um, conditional on the fact that you now have uh, delayed execution. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the we see the question of how transactions get ordered as being uh, totally orthogonal to like everything else that happens. You know, like something chooses the order and then the nodes communicate about that order, decide it, and then execute it. Um, in version zero of Monad, it's a priority gas auction. In future versions, it's possible that we'll integrate with something like Flashbots or maybe Flashbots itself. Um, to allow ordering to take into account um, bundles. And basically, I think maybe what you're getting at is that um, with only priority gas auction, like certain competitions between searchers just get settled by um, by spam. So yeah, that's, that's like definitely quite important on the horizon. But, um, you know, like most other blockchains other than Ethereum, basically just use priority gas auction at this point with a sufficiently high um, gas co or like minimum cost so that while there is spam, it's like kind of similar to the postal service. Like postal service carries a lot of spam and <laughs> it's fine. Like people just pay for every, every piece of junk mail that they want to send. Um, yeah. And our focus is really on making sure that we can execute super efficiently so that we can carry a lot of, a lot of transactions um, and then over time, we'll evolve with respect to um, weeding out spam through different a, a variety of different strategies. Maybe um, ultimately, I, I'm curious, like it, just from your background, uh, being in high frequency trading, being at Jump, uh, it feels like you could have started a new layer one or layer two kind of on. Uh, with any kind of new virtual machine, why specifically did you choose Ethereum or the Ethereum virtual machine? Uh, was it just the existing infrastructure and tooling uh, or was it just tapping into that like developer base? 
I think um, with any technology, it should exist to solve a very clear problem. And I think for us, the clear problem is that developers are limited in what they can build. Like most developers are, are EVM developers. They're using Solidity. They're they're using their tool set. Um, it's kind of like the JavaScript of, of crypto. Um, 97% of all TVL is EVM TVL. Um, so it has the mind share, like there are a lot of developers, but then they're just facing sort of like severe problems in terms of cost of gas, um, the low plentifulness of transactions. And then they're doing a lot, jumping through a lot of hoops, like optimizing tiny amounts of gas um, in order to save for end users. Um, and in the process, perhaps um, even sometimes like having worse security practices from a smart contract perspective because they're omitting defensive assertions or omitting extra checks that would cost more gas. We just don't want there to be that trade-off. Like um, a developer should never omit a defensive assertion because it's going to cost a little bit more gas. So our view is really that we need to go where the developers are and solve real problems for them. Uh, and then at a later point in time, um, like in subsequent versions of Monad, we'll make additional improvements to the EVM in the form of new precompiles, um, perhaps some new opcodes, new VM behaviors um, enabled by runtime flags that'll help developers in the other dimension, which is um, you know, making it easier for them to build high performance applications. So th there's this uh, there's this interesting paradigm that um, we see sort of people move back and forth between se sec basically security and gas costs, right? Mm -hmm. We have these very clear security practices that we developed over time, and every once in a while, um, somebody comes up with a clever and obfuscated way of getting around it to yeah. think that they sort of reduce costs. And all you've done is a Rude Goldberg machine to to introduce reentrancy, right? If you look at the just the graveyard of uh, uh, exploits, they basically are one big form of reentrancy, at least mm -hmm. at least some of the, the more uh, astonishing ones. And so I, I always found that amusing. So I, I, I admire the this idea that there are certain trade-offs that need not be made at all. Uh, and instead, they just need to be table stakes. Yeah, I think um, P. Caver... Satchio's uh, list of reentrancy attacks on GitHub is a really, really good one to look through. I think um, it's good inspiration for all of us as developers, whether smart contract developers or system developers. You really got to make it, um, yeah, so that because uh, there a lot of them are quite convoluted, and as you said, a lot of them really just result from um, the fact that. You know, later on down the call stack, you can re-enter the same function that was already had been visited before, and that's like a pretty unexpected, hard to think about thing. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that we're planning on introducing, um, perhaps in this version that we'll release at the end of the year, or perhaps like in the version after that. But definitely thinking about a lot of improvements like that. One thing that I've um really loved recently has kind of been your more informative Twitter posts from Monad and even I think your personal account, uh, kind of highlighting the different data availability and the limited throughput that Ethereum has today and kind of running the math on what that actually provides to uh, roll-ups at the end of the day. And I think very few people actually kind of run that math, but could you kind of walk us through some of those numbers that uh, you've provided on Twitter and ultimately how the Monad team is ultimately thinking about increasing uh, the base layer throughput such that developers don't have to worry about these more expensive gas costs. Yeah, definitely. I think our team's mentality overall is just that, um, Yeah, like uh, for for any any design that we're considering, we just have to run the numbers and, and use common sense. And I know it's hard for like um, everyday users because there are just so many. They're like inundated with so many different like you know ads for different projects, and um, it's hard to cut through the noise. But I think at the end of the day, 
um the like rollups are um so I, I guess I have two responses and and one is like you know what are what are rollups really good for like what is what is the fundamental constraint of any system um and then the other one is like the specifics of sort of the math of EIP 4844 and um the expected throughput of rollups right now after EIP 4844 etc um I think I maybe want to talk about the first one just for a second. Um, you know, you see a lot of debates on Twitter, um, and Tolly has kind of had this, taken this stance as well, which is that at the end of the day, it's really just about um, decentralized data storage and like how efficiently your network can propagate information about transactions through a decentralized network, um, which can then, you know, like, the the individual nodes can then go execute using whatever runtime they have, like in Solana's case, the the C level runtime with et cetera. Um, but the the constraint is really like just how much data you can propagate through the network. And so I think people who have like sort of um, very fantastical like beliefs about what rollups will be able to achieve aren't like at the end of the day, the constraint is really the data availability, like the amount of uh, throughput you can have to like propagate a bunch of transactions through a decentralized data store. Now, if this data store is not decentralized, then you can probably get a lot more throughput, but then that really subverts the actual purpose of what, what we're all doing here. So um, I think, you know, some of the frustration that you see in some of his posts is just the like, people apply sort of like a fantastical standard to um, to like the possibility of rollups while um, you know, not looking at like what existing systems like Solana can do right now. And not, he's, I don't want to put words in his mouth. So I think I'll probably just go back and look at Twitter to see what he said, but it's like, you know, if there is really a magical thing that can deliver all this data availability, then like Solana will happily use it. Um, and so it's really about like, the efficiency of propagation of data through the network. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I think ultimately it took me personally a while to learn about kind of these core bottlenecks and as you mentioned, data availability being one of them um, or kind of the key thing uh, that really unlocks scalability to the masses. And ultimately today that's very limited and less than, typically in the megabytes per seconds of data, I think eventually it'll get to gigabytes and then probably further pushed upon that. But um, so in that point of view, with layer twos and even layer threes, are is it your point of view that it should be done all on kind of a single layer and that these additional layers are not particularly useful for scaling or how do you view them like directly? Right. Um, so I think to um, address the question that you were asking before about basically like run run me through the numbers of, you know, what systems will, you know, look like right now and what will look like in the future. Um, so I'll just try to do that really quickly because I think that informs your, your question just now as well. Um, so like right now, the gas limit on Ethereum is... Um, it's a target of 15 million gas per block, and a block is every 12 seconds, so that's about a million gas per second. Um, and then additionally, um, the cost per byte of call data is 16 bytes, sorry, 16 gas per byte. So if you take the roughly one megabyte per second, um, Sorry, I'm just messing up numbers all over the place. Okay, starting again. So 15 million gas, 12 seconds. So that's about a million gas per second. And then uh, 16 gas per byte. So if you divide a million gas by 16 gas, you get, um, what is it, about 60 kilobytes uh, per second. Is that right? Did I do that right? It's like a million divided by 16. Yeah, so 62, it's like 000. 62,000 bytes, so 62 kilobytes per second. Um, 
And then the average transaction on Ethereum right now is about 250 bytes. Um, so if you do 62,500 divided by 250, you get about 250 transactions per second. Um, and that's assuming that all of the, this is assuming a couple of things. So one is that it's assuming that the entire block is uh, like all of the gas in the block is being used for um, transaction data, which is not probably not going to be true. Um, and then it's also assuming that there's no compression on the transactions, which is also not necessarily true or definitely not true actually. So let's fix that second one. Um, so right now transaction about 250 bytes on Ethereum mainnet, but you can actually compress those transactions by a fact currently seeing like compression of about 2x, um, which then increases the throughput by about 2x. So we go from 250 to about 500. And when you say compression, are you specifically talking about L2s? Um, yeah, so I'm talking about the, actually, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so one of the benefits of uh, L2s and then the posting of call data back to L1 is that that transaction data um, doesn't really need to be like directly used most of the time. It's really just there as a record. Um, so that transaction data could be compressed. Um, and in practice, that's what uh, we see rollups like Optimism or Arbitrum do and getting about a 2x compression factor. Well, it depends, obviously, what you publish to the L1 ultimately as well. The call data versus the actual differentials. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the other, um, you know, asterisk to my math is that um, with uh, with zk rollups, like with certain designs, I guess, um, such as with zk sync era, there's the potential, or there is the behavior of posting the differences to all of the state values, like all the slots. Um, rather than posting the full transaction data. Um, and, you know, the proof can still like validate against that data. Um, and so if that is smaller, then, you know, that additionally allows for more throughput. I, I guess at the end of the day, so like maybe we did like the math showed that with Ethereum as it stands today, the data availability and the number of transaction throughput is relatively small. Uh, it is going to be increasing over time with 4844 and then ultimately kind of the full, they, it always confuses me. It, is it dank sharding or full full sharding roadmap? But uh, at, at the numbers are 1.3 megabytes per second um, of mm -hmm. like available throughput. Is it your opinion, just to clarify on like layer twos that uh, I guess, like, what what is your stance on layer twos and layer threes, and then what is the approach that you specifically at Monad are taking to ultimately uh, get more scalability? Um, yeah, I think the so the my view is that in existing systems right now, we kind of know what the what the throughput will be. And then there's additional improvements that come from, um, like you mentioned, EIP 4844. Um, that one in particular adds another 250 kilobytes per second. Uh, sorry, 250 kilobytes per block. So about another 20 kilobytes per second of throughput. So I think previously we said there's like 60 and then you're adding another 20. So then it's like a 30% increase. So we go from 500-ish to um, 600 50, 700 ish. Um, but I think the, yeah, at the end of the day, the blockchain kind of has two different things that it needs to do. And one is have distributed consensus about an official record of transactions. Um, and then the other thing that needs to get done is actually just the execution of, um, of those transactions. And in Monad, we're just focusing on optimizing both and having a really efficient system for executing a bunch of transactions and uh, making the, the appropriate state transitions. Um, and we also do that by just making improvements at the algorithmic level so that then all nodes that are running the system um, can direct, like anyone can run that kind of node and directly just query that node for like the, you know, the values of um, whatever account they want to know about or any contract, any 
state variable there. Um, I think there, there are a lot of other systems that are being developed that have certain advantages as well. Um, I think the main advantage of a rollup is that you can move computation off chain. So it enables the potential for much more complex computation to happen. Like if you imagine um, inverting matrices or just doing like a bunch of, I don't know, updating neural nets, or it's just something complicated. Like it is kind of inefficient for that to be run on every single node. Um, so there is the potential that it could just be run in this smaller set of nodes. Um, and then that, that other environment just is kind of like a side environment to do a lot of computation. And then the bridging is still clear when, um, whenever users need to transfer assets back or forth from that specialized environment. Um, but with Monad, we're just really focused on improving execution for all the nodes and then having as efficient as possible of a decentralized consensus method for propagating that transaction data across all the nodes um, so that we can deliver the best performance. So on, on consensus, you do end up using um, just out of the box Tendermint, or I know you have some improvements mm -hmm. on, on that as well. Yeah, um, we use the Tendermint algorithm right now. Um, it's like the Tendermint paper, uh, but not the Cosmos SDK implementation. Um, that one has a lot of inefficiencies, like places where one component is talking to another one by polling it, and you know, like that introduces latency. Um, there's and, inefficient and data structures. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, actually, let's talk. This is the question that uh, Logan loves to ask, but never ends up asking: uh, overhead costs. Um, messaging between nodes. So um, is there any improvement there as well? Um, yeah, we have some improvements coming from um, uh, making block proposals just refer to um, transaction IDs instead of including the full transaction data. Um, I believe uh, some people refer to this as like shared mempool. Um, so, you know, like the idea that we propagate the transactions through the mempool, um, we have a lot of improvements there as well, improving the, the P2P network for um, propagating transactions through the mempool. But then when all of your nodes actually have records of those transactions already, then you can just communicate a proposal as a reference to those transaction IDs. And then is there, is there a small subset of nodes that you can query? So there's this idea of like a sparse node or a node that doesn't have to, because we were already saying something about dependencies, I, I'm not necessarily interested in all state, just a, a subset of state mm -hmm. that sort of sits in, in, in the corner and doesn't interact with the rest of state. So is, this, is there like a distinct class of nodes that you can use for, let's say, for querying or for quicker partial synchrony with the, uh, um, with the sort of, with the, uh, canonical chain and, and so on. Um, we don't, we don't have something like that. That's an interesting idea, but, uh, haven't done anything like that. So I, I guess at the end of the day, I, I, I want to like ultimately relate some of this back to like the user standpoint. We have, we have gotten fairly technical and all, even on the developer side of things. I guess w what you would really like to have happen is, I guess, by creating Monad, uh, being able to kind of unlock the EVM experience on the developer side that allows developers to build interesting apps, have high throughput, have parallelization, um, and being able to take advantage of kind of all the tooling that currently exists. Yeah, I think there is sort of like a common standard that's been developed with EVM. Um, really has a strong network effect. Like a lot of the applied cryptography research is being done in the context of EVM as well. Um, you know, we talk about developers and libraries, but there's also the researchers to take into account. The goal is really just to unblock them, like you said, and remove considerations like um, gas optimization that is trading security for um, for gas potentially. And also in the longer term, make improvements to the EVM 
um, you know, extend and embrace the EVM, introduce new new features that help developers build more powerful apps. Yeah, interesting. I, I love it. Um, I guess on terms of like data throughput initially, I mean, because we were talking about that quite substantially, is there any expectations that you will have what kind of monad comes online or that like eventually that you're targeting? Uh, in terms of the throughput through the network? Correct. Um, and how it translates ultimately to TPS. Mm, yeah, I think ultimately the the network uh, throughput is really going to be the the driver of the terminal TPS for a given a given chain. Um, you know, there'll be probably many chains, like there'll be many Monad instances, um, each with its own connected set of validators and a bunch of apps maybe that are related to each other that are all in that instance. Um, I, you know, I, I, our goal and our, our focus is, um, like, yeah, our, right now our, our expectation is 10,000 TPS, um, for typical transaction size and complexity um, as Ethereum mainnet right now. Um, but I think in the long term, it'll it'll go up as um, we're able to make additional improvements to the P2P layer and the messaging propagation. These different instances, uh, are they related to each other in any way? Uh, well, I was just referring to like the, the fact that uh, that's kind of like my mental model for how how like what the end state for blockchains is is a bunch of different instances like the way that there's polygon supernets or avalanche subnets like they're just separate instances of shared global state um run generally by separate validators um we see that as part of our long-term roadmap but i think it's too early to speculate on like how many such instances there will be right now no, but certainly the the idea is how they ultimately inherit something interesting or something useful from the base chain, from the main instance, right? In mm -hmm. the case of hyperchains or L3s or whatever, right? Let's say you just have this uh, recursive ladder of verifiers where you're just doing L3 submit, you know, LN plus one submits to LN and so on, and then you get down to uh, the base layer. Is this something that you're considering or are you are we basically talking about separate chains? Um, I think it's just too early to say right now. We have to focus on the first monad before we... Um, but I think the things you said are... They, they make sense. Interesting. Interesting. No, it's... Uh, I, I find it fascinating. I, I think all these different blockchains are taking kind of slightly different approach. To me, it seems fairly obvious, in my point of view, that parallelization on the virtual machine side will will be kind of the path forward. Um, and so definitely excited that you're pushing the space forward and the Ethereum space forward with that. I guess in long term, like I, it's kind of like a competition in a sense for developers. Do you feel like Monad is competing directly with Ethereum or is it just trying to grow the pie overall uh, in the space? No, we're not competing with Ethereum. I think... The, there really needs to be a lot of growth of developers um, in order for all of crypto to grow. Um, we're just focused on, I guess, what you would say, like um, high frequency or like high transaction count, low value per transaction types of applications, um, which I think is like pretty orthogonal to where I, I personally feel Ethereum will end up converging, which is like, you know, valuable NFTs are probably going to be minted on Ethereum because um, that's where they have the greatest Lindy effect. Um, you know, like, I think it's it's just opening up a different kind of dimension for developers to focus. And um, ultimately, if we want to have applications that have a million daily active users or 5 million daily active users, like they're going to need a backend that can do like a million or 5 million times 20 or a hundred transactions per user per day, which then ends up becoming like 20 million, a hundred million transactions per day, um, which translates to like, uh, say for 20 million transactions per day, that's 200 TPS for, uh, 
a hundred million, that's a thousand transactions per second. Like we're just going to need systems that can process at least 10,000 transactions per second in order to be able to support a single app like that. Yeah. I guess like to the engineers watching, what, what is the pitch of like building on Monad uh, versus like some other high throughput chains in the space, such as Solana or like SWE, um, Aptos? And, and maybe say something about uh, compatibility equivalence. Um, I know you said at some point you're going to introduce different opcodes. Um, so it's, at some point you're just going to branch off. But what about sort of out of the box, the layer, you know, Mon version one of Monad? Right. Yeah, I think it's it's for those developers, it's having no vendor lock-in. Like they're, they can build for EVM, which is a standard, and um, just go where, where users and usages dictate um, and where the transaction fees make sense for the users. Um, I mentioned that we will, you know, make improvements to the EVM. Um, our North Star is always going to be backward compatibility with Ethereum. So, you know, these are more like optional features that people can opt into. And of course, if they find them really valuable and those are essential to building the kinds of apps that are trying to support 10 million users and they have to do that on Monad, then you know, like it's going to be fine anyway, but if they're building a more generic thing, they don't use these features, then of course they could just deploy them in other environments as well. I think there's a future in which um, a lot of the improvements uh, that are done, especially the ones that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, uh, the ones that can are relatively simple to implement on the, on the client side, I think it ends up being implemented. There's no reason in the same way that, uh, you know, when you see something that's so obvious that somebody ends up actually building it, there's no reason not to adopt it. So I think there's there's a certainly a, a positive sum game being played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We definitely intend to push changes back to Ethereum as EIPs, although, you know, we don't know if the community will accept them or not. That's like another game. But I think having a another environment where it's already implemented and where developers are taking advantage of that feature, that's a really you know, it actually makes it a lot easier to push forward improvements to Ethereum. Well, speaking of this, this question I, I always like to ask, and it's it's more on the um, it's more on the negative as opposed to the positive, like mm -hmm. what you would subtract. If you had a magic wand, what would you remove from Ethereum today? And by magic wand, I mean you wouldn't introduce anything that would basically uh, break consensus or or produce some sort of crazy runtime error. Um, and the answer, just to anchor this, the answer I usually get is uh, uh, the wretched ERC twenty. Right? This is this is basically the one I always get. Mm. I'm curious your take. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it would be nice to have a, a canonical token standard without the possibility of like uh, you know partial burn on transfer or like all these weird things that then introduce edge cases um, for apps that are on top of them. Um, but I think if I had to choose something else, I would probably say self-destruct um, because I think <laughs> it just introduces a lot of like sort of weird state dependency issues. But I think that's been deprecated now, or I think, or at least nobody, nobody uses, uh, oh, uses they get rid I haven't of seen a lot of instances. Interesting. Yeah, okay. maybe we have to check. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check. Maybe my wish has already come true then. <laughs> The other thing I, I was a little bit curious about is, I guess, over time, the other thing that a lot of blockchains today at least debate upon is kind of the number of full nodes that I guess is sufficient to say you're decentralized. Um, and then also kind of what hardware um, or what is the appropriate level of cost for a specific hardware? Could you share a little bit more on your thoughts around like what you're ultimately trying to achieve on like the full node sides, and then what nodes from the hard what are the nodes running from the hardware perspective? Mm -hmm. um, our expectations are um, actually pretty similar to Ethereum's. It's like a eight core CPU, um, sixteen gigs of RAM. Two terabyte SSD. Um, I think that that one, like Ethereum, in, in previous times has opted for a smaller SSD, but um, two terabytes is like two hundred fifty dollars right now, so it's pretty reasonable. 
um, and then 100 megabits per second of uh, upload and download uh, network bandwidth. And so I guess like the big thing that you differentiate there from like a core Ethereum, and this goes back to like increasing throughput, is just the bandwidth speeds on up, upload and download. Right. Makes a lot of sense. No, I, I, I really, I mean, if anything, now I've kind of become a high throughput maxi, uh, just because of I really like data availability and uh, being able to post a lot to things on chain, whether it's an L2 or just doing a lot of reads and writes. Maybe getting back to like the original question of like high frequency trading and being able to do like mini bids and ask on chain for different order books. What's kind of the throughput expectations either in terms of TPS or just like bandwidth required, do you think to bring those bid and ask spreads to, uh, I would say um, as close as to comparable as like high frequency trading as possible? Um, so yeah, I guess there's sort of two answers to that question. And one is related to the cost of each update. Um, we think that, um, the cost of each update needs to be a cent or less, um, which is also true in Solana, like for Serum or now OpenBook, um, we, you know, like the more expensive it is, the less that uh, market makers are going to update their quotes, um, which then means that they're just going to have to quote a little bit wider so that they don't, uh, you know, like the fair value will wiggle a little bit more without them making changes. Um, but yeah, the like the numbers are kind of like, you know, at, at uh, a tenth of a cent, then if you send 50 million orders a day, um, it's, wait, sorry, did I get that right? Uh, 50 million orders per day. Um, yeah, it's $50,000 per day. Um, 50 million orders per day is kind of like the, um, let's see. So let me, let me back up a little bit. So in, in centralized exchanges, like the most liquid ones, um, with the most number of participants, you could see like, 10 million orders per day. Uh, but of course it's like the uh, number of orders is elastic. Like if that's because you charge zero cents per order. So if you charge a 10th of a cent instead, then maybe like that 10 million would become 1 million or something like that without too much of an effect on the liquidity. Um, so yeah, we sort of think that like $50,000 per day worth of fees um, being expended by uh, major participants to support like a hundred ish markets makes sense. 50, that's $50,000 divided by a hundred. Um, it's $500 per day per market. So that's not too bad. Um, so that's one answer is like a 10th of a cent. But then I think the other thing is actually just like, if you're trying to build an exchange, then you need to have, um, you need to have like real natural users. Like for any exchange, there's kind of when in our HFT days, we would talk about like HFTs versus naturals and naturals are just there to like transfer risk to, to like buy AMC stock or sell Bitcoin or whatever. Um, you really need, uh, is that what you call? So you call a noise trader naturals. That's what I would call it. Yeah. I guess different people have different, <laughs> different names, but, um, you just natural participants. So, um, at the end of the day, if you want to build a really good exchange, you need to have, um, you know, a lot of it is about user onboarding and user experience. And so when I sort of reflect on like the Solana and Serum, um, you know, Serum actually did like kind of offer that in the sense that the transaction fees are less than a cent per transaction. Um, but the problem was really just like user acquisition. And it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Um, you need a lot of liquidity so that the spreads are tight so that users have a good experience. And then you need that liquidity to then beget a lot of users that are taking advantage of that. And you got a good virtuous cycle. Um, and I think one of the problems with Serum is that the, you know, like the Serum token, I, there's like a lot of uh, stuff in the news now about how like, oh, Alameda actually just owned all the Serum. Like that's, that's not good. So really it, I would say that a effective, a successful, on-chain limit order book launch would involve 
um, kind of like redoing the tokenomics, like having the distribution be such that that token can be used to incentivize market makers and real participants to go take advantage of this. And then that could bootstrap into a successful ecosystem. But uh, to be fair, it, all major exchange, centralized exchanges, forget crypto for a second, and they also require uh, significant bootstrapping, but they do this with off-chain agreements, basically. They do this with uh, requiring people to be there and there are you know, certain legal contracts in place and there's a, a certain amount of liquidity that you need to provide. And there are, you know, the concept of rebates, right? The, the idea of uh, LP tokens is not new, right? So there are lots of structures in place that you need to bootstrap. However, the interesting bit is the market makers don't usually have equity in the exchange, if uh, which is something that's... Uh, sort of counterintuitive because in, in crypto when you do any sort of liquidity rewards or liquidity mining, you're basically giving someone something. I don't know what it is that you're giving them, but something that resembles some sort of pseudo equity mm-hmm. at the actual exchange. So there's, there's something funny about the bootstrapping model of on-chain order books that I think is different. So w- w- what do you think about that specifically given your, your background? Yeah, I think the ability to give the, um, these participants, um skin in the game is actually you know it's overall positive like it makes it more feasible to bootstrap an exchange than it is in traditional finance um but that is just so if you're asking like why aren't there a ton of like successful dexes given that possibility the answer is twofold one is that it's really really hard to launch a centralized exchange like really 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 hard um there's like hundreds of failed exchanges and a jump we would make markets on exchanges sometimes that ultimately ended up failing. Like they just weren't able to get enough um, taker flow and enough natural flow to really get off the ground. Um, so you're going from like, I don't know, really low odds of success to like higher chance of success when you have, you're armed with the ability to um, incentivize the the market maker or the participants that are making continuous two sided markets, um, but I think the other factor is just that um, you know, like you need a confluence of you need the the stars to kind of line up. Like you need lots of users, you need market makers, you need cheap fees. Um, from the perspective of Monad, what we're bringing is um, low cost EVM compatibility, which we think will make it easier for users to use and easier for developers to build the developers building that exchange to build, um, and potentially easier for market makers to interface as well, because it's also EVM. So I, I think it's, it's like part of the reason it hasn't happened, uh, is like, it's hard. And another part is that you do need all these prerequisites and we're trying to help line up all those prerequisites. If there's one piece about uh, user experience that's missing today, even from centralized exchanges, so let me ask you the question in in two ways. One, let's talk about DEXs, and the other, let's talk about centralized exchanges. Mm -hmm. What is missing fundamentally on, I guess I don't want to name any centralized exchanges today because everybody seems to be in hot water, but uh, uh, you know know what I mean. Um, Well, I think... Yeah, the the killer features are capital efficiency, aka margin, um, and then I guess specifically, if you want to get advanced, it's portfolio margin. It's like, um, you know, being able to go long one coin or one perpetual, and then short the other one, um, using the PNL of the entire of the entire account. Right, and I think margin. that's just quite complicated because I believe that even with centralized exchanges in traditional finance when they allow margin usually the the risk calculations are you know it's like the you know someone is using a spreadsheet to compute like historical correlations between like microsoft and google and then saying like okay i guess it's okay for this person to be like long one and short the other and we'll give them like credit for 60% 60% of their, you know, it's like really, it's not very precise either. So, and then it's just tricky in crypto when a lot of the assets have much higher volatilities and you could have like random things like mobile coin on FTX happen where like the thing goes up by 10 X. And so I think it's, it's just, um, so wait, you're, you're saying that VAR doesn't work. 
Is that what you tell is that what you're saying? I yeah, I would <laughs> say that it's probably better to have something where like there's more like a real time like observation of the available liquidity um so that then margining can be done based on the real time state of the book so that then we know like if we have to stop out this person by closing out their short position like this is how much of an impact it'll have on the market but that's a very tricky problem because then you know like that could then trigger further liquidations which then further move the price so it's it's all very i don't know i guess what i'm saying is it's all stitched together in uh cfi and tradfi as well um and anyway that's just like that would be the dream that would be the dream would be to have portfolio margining and i think um but even just more generally allowing people to take leverage is um really the killer feature but do, maybe do you to think ask the, the just because of time uh asking kind of like the final question uh for like 2023 what on a high level, I mean, maybe two questions. When do you plan to kind of go live or how's kind of the test net progressing? And then for the remaining of the year, what specifically are you looking forward to? Um, test net is progressing well. We're just, as a team, working super hard to ship the test net as soon as we can. Um, currently, we think in a couple of months. Um, we're targeting end of year, like December for mainnet. Um, but we'd like to allow for enough time to have like six months of test net. So it might be a little bit after that. Um, and then for me, I'm, and for our whole team, like just excited about, um, partnering with builders who have ambitious plans to build real apps that provide real utility for normal non-crypto natives in addition to crypto natives, and yeah, just excited about the sort of like the open design space coming from much cheaper gas. Definitely agree. Well, uh, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you joining us. I uh, hope you had as much fun as we did uh, kind of going in the technical uh, deep dive and excited for what is to come. Uh, I, too, am very excited for what engineers can ultimately create once Jap gas is much cheaper. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me.